I will be reading Psalm 19, uh, NIV version. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth. Their words to the end of the world. In the heavens, God has pitched a tent for the sun. It is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is deprived of its warmth. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. They are more precious than gold, than they are pure gold. They are more sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. By them your servant is warned. In keeping them there is great reward. But who can discern their own errors? Forgive my hidden self. Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Then I will be blameless, innocent of great transgression. May these words of my mouth and his meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight. Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Thanks so much for doing the Bible reading, Betty, and particularly ringing this morning and stepping in last minute off the bench. So thank you. Um, it's very much appreciated. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this morning uh, and we thank you that we can gather and consider the truths of your word. We pray whether if we're little, not so little, or in everything in between, whether if we're online or sitting here right now, through the power of your spirit, speak to us not just individually, but as a church. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as you've heard, um, we are doing a little short little snippets of sermons, particularly during our little break here at the moment. And particularly as we move towards starting next week, we're going to be looking over the Ten Commandments over the next few weeks. And this morning, what I want us to consider in the psalm that was just read to you, perhaps you're very familiar with it, it's a well-known psalm. Here are three things I want us to consider. Firstly, how creation speaks of God in verses 1 to 6. Secondly, how God's word speaks of God in verses 7 to 11. And then asking ourselves the question, including myself, will our lives speak about God in verses 12 to 14. So firstly, creation speaks of God, verses 1 to 6. Up here on the screen uh, is a little picture. That's Oh yeah, that's a great picture, isn't it? To those of you who have HD TVs, I apologize right now what you're seeing on your screen. In our culture, there's been an interesting word that I find really fascinating called a selfie. You can take that off the screen now. The selfie really, uh, really, uh, I think, really speaks about our culture, uh, speaks about us, really, at the heart of it. It's nothing new, where life is ultimately about us. I don't know if you've done this, I've done this for sure, where you're standing next to something that's amazing, like a sunset or a great mountaintop, and you put your face in front of it and take a photo. Um, I've done that over and over again. I don't know if you've ever put away your phone and you've had one of those moments where you have gone uh, to something that's of creation and it's really just taken your breath away. Sometimes these things are there specifically, I think, to speak to us, to remind us how little we are and that actually there is someone much greater and mightier than us. For me, uh, it's those moments up here on the screen. There's another picture of, of where I love the beach. The beach is the moment where, particularly when there are massive waves and especially if there's a lightning storm, I love it. It's a reminder of how great God is and how small I am. And those of you already looking saying, we know you're small, Shabu, yeah, that's correct. King David is writing the psalm. He was a shepherd once before he became a king. And he must have seen creation all the time in the fields as he uh, looked after the sheep. 
To him, creation speaks something quite specifically. It's declaring something. Did you see that in the first verses? The glory of God. The glory of God from the very heavens, that is the sky to each day, all through the earth, even to the very ends of the world. Both the skies, that's the description of the heavens, even the sun itself is revealing and declaring and saying something, and that something is the very glory of God. It's a moment perhaps for us to consider the very creation that you and I are part of and living in, it's verbally in a sense speaking to all of us in our day-to-day life of how glorious God is. We see that, right? Uh, For those of us particularly uh, who don't know Christ, you might actually look at creation and go, look at the amazing flower or or the things around you, which is beautiful. For those of us who do know God, there's another layer to it. Creation is seen through a different lens. We're seeing God's glorious handiwork. But also, as the psalmist says, as David says, it's ultimately pointing to God. Uh, This week, uh, one of the things I love doing when I'm here at the office is every time there's someone walking their dogs through our property, as much as possible, I love to go and talk to them. And there's one particular neighbour who walks their dog, and they were out the front, and I quickly beelined along to say hello to them, and uh, they came and said hi, including their dog. I had to pretend I liked the dog, but that's fine. And this dog's jumping on me. It's really great. Um, And then they um, said hello, and we were chatting about life and things, And then there's this picture up here on the screen. I don't know if I put it up in time, guys. If I didn't, don't worry about it. There, right in front, apparently these are some sort of flowers. Yes, you can tell I'm a gardener. And she said to me, have you smelt them? I'm like, no, because I don't know what's been around those flowers. (laughs) And so she came and said, grabbed a bunch. She said, smell it. And I went, ugh. And I've got to be honest, I couldn't smell anything. (laughs) But she smelled it. Isn't it beautiful? Now, this neighbor doesn't know Jesus yet. We're working on that. But there's something stirring in her to ask there's something beyond this life. For us who know, who are followers of Christ, we know we see something like this. For those of you who like flowers, and you see something far more beautiful. But what creation is ultimately saying, it's declaring how glorious is God. As, loved one, as one commentator put it in my readings this week, it's up here on the screen, God's glory is the manifestation of the perfection of all his attributes. The doctrine of the glory of God emphasizes his greatness and transcendence, his splendor and holiness. This is what creation is doing. It's speaking of God's glory. Now, creation not only speaks, the very word of God also speaks. That God's word speaks of who he is in verses 7 to 11. In these verses, you're hearing terms that you're going to become very familiar with, particularly if you jump into Exodus before we uh, consider the Ten Commandments. It's all this language that's dripped out through the Bible. It's describing God's Word. That is, God's Word is His very speech. The very laws are God's divine ordered decisions. Statutes are God's uh, relational standard with His people commands as he gives for their good and for our good the decrees that he declares through his words are not just someone saying something because he is a king he's decreeing the very precepts showing the relational uh, language that we have or the relationship we have with the god of the universe the very word of god is the promises of god which means that as you've already heard in the testimonies god's word is true and trustworthy And just as you and I, when we look at the glorious colors of a sunset or a sunrise, what it declares is God's glorious, how glorious he is, God's word itself is multi-layered. But this multi-layered word of God brings life, it breathes life into our soul. Did you hear that? Did you read that in the verses? Reviving the soul. And in this wonderful promise and doing and living out his word, there is great reward. And perhaps this is the moment for you and I to ask, we say this all the time, to ask the question, is God's word 
true in that is it much more than just words that ultimately tell us how to live a moral standard. It's there. Or particularly even this week, as I was kind of mucking around with an AI-generated little program to figure out how it works. You might have thoughts on that. I've definitely got thoughts on that. But this particular document, I put this, this chapter in, and you know what it came back as? This historical document. Now, I get it, what they're trying to say. It is a historical document, but it's much more than that, right? See, for David, God's word is everything. It encompasses and gives life, as David says. That's why he describes it so fine and beautiful, much more than gold. This is a king who would have seen gold all around him. And it's even more, much more beautiful and tastes finer and sweeter than the most expensive honey that you can find. I wonder often, myself included by the way, we struggle to consider God's word because maybe it has become just a book to some of us. But when it becomes more than that, it will, because it is alive, will revive our souls. Have we not already heard that in this morning, in the testimonies, in the very different seasons of life, how God's Word revived their hearts and souls? Perhaps you've experienced this in your own life, when things are challenging and tough, and someone either messages you, or you read it for yourself, whatever it might be, and it speaks into your heart. It revives your heart and soul. So our lives then also need to speak. This is God's word speaks of God. Now our lives need to speak about God in verses 12 to 14. See, when you and I hear and see God displaying himself and the very words of God revives our hearts and souls, it should do something in us. And this is what David's response is. As God's word speaks to him, revives his souls, he says, who can know his own errors? In other words, both creation and the word itself is revealing something. It's showing us the contrast. It's showing us how broken we are, that we're not innocent. But what is the hope for David? What is the hope for us through God's word? It's to cry out to God because of who he is, how he's revealed himself. In other words, what David's doing is crying out for grace, crying out for mercy. And see, all of this is ultimately pointing and hinting to the true glory that is displayed in his word, to ultimately reveal that you and I still need grace, whether if you've been a follower just for a week, for a long time, or if you're not a follower yet. Later on, the Apostle Paul would actually write to Timothy and he would say these words in 2 Timothy three fourteen to 16. You would know this. But as for you... Continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of because you know that those from you learned it. And how from infancy, since you were a little kid, Timothy, you've known the Holy Scriptures. So for Timothy, it's the Old Testament, even the Psalms that we're reading, to make you for what? Wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. And all Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. And we've seen this as well as we've explored in the Gospel of Matthew how I love the way the Hebrew writer describes it in Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3. He, that is Christ, is the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. What amazing imagery and truth. The one who is indeed our redeemer, the one who indeed is our rock in whom we built our life on. And because of him, and because of his perfect life, because of his perfect work, because of who he is, the one who is indeed glorious, the one who will ultimately truly restore our life, the one who is described as the Redeemer, this is the one that we come to. So friends, this morning as we finish, I just want to ask some things to you. So firstly and foremost, if you do not know Christ... God created this world, yes, for you to enjoy. It's his grace to you, but also it's declaring and inviting you to consider to be in relationship with him. But not based on your standards or your laws or statutes, but to realize when you stand next to God's law, God's statutes, 
We've all fallen short, the glory of God, that we do need a Redeemer in Jesus. We pray that you would consider seeking him, inviting him, debating with who Christ is. And there are these little ones all around you, little ones. We would love for you as a church family to, yes, read your Bible, to sing songs about the Bible, all these wonderful things. But we plead to Jesus that it will ultimately point your hearts to him. Maybe tonight before you head to bed, not as your strategy to stay up late, but genuinely, uh, say to your mum or your grandma or grandpa or auntie and uncle, hey, tell me what verses really touched your heart, mum and dad. Followers of Christ, uh, we have been invited to enjoy God's creation in this time and season, but we pray that you will see the glory of who he is. Perhaps if you have a grandchild or Maybe if you're a mum or dad, in the midst of going out and doing your various things, look for moments in how you can point kids and little ones to God, the Creator. Perhaps you and I, when we're at the beach next time, rather than taking selfies of ourselves in the beach, which is fine, it's not a sin, you can do that, maybe consider reading a psalm out with them. To those of us who are in a season of go, 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 Maybe the invitation is for you and I to be still and to know who God is, but through his word, revealing that he's the one who will restore, the one who is redeemer, and perhaps he's inviting you to maybe stop, consider, and listen his word, to his word. See, God's word is indeed a gift of grace to show us that we need a redeemer every day as he reveals what is hidden in our own lives. But as children, we read this differently. We read this in the light of grace and God says there's no condemnation for anyone who is in Christ. And this source, the word of God, becomes a source of life because it's all of his grace. Is it not, church family? Each Sunday, uh, we take communion as a reminder of his grace. So I would invite you to grab the elements now as we head towards the end of our service. If you do not know Jesus as your Lord and Saviour, we would invite you to hold off from partaking in this, but ask the question, why? Uh, We would love for you to talk to any of us about why you shouldn't take it. And we'd love to point you to the reason why you should when you give your life to him. But for those of us who are followers of Christ, can I invite you to do this? Firstly, let's eat the wafer. Why don't you eat the wafer and I will eat mine after. But let's eat as a reminder of God's good grace to us and taste and see the Lord is good. Now let's drink this juice as a reminder of the blood that was shed that cleanses us of all our sin and reminds us daily of the grace that we need. I'm going to invite the music team to come up now as they lead us in the truth of your word. May these words continue to be something that shapes all our hearts. And now as we respond both in song and in prayer, may we know you more. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.